OK, so moving on, we'll look at how the Nazis controlled the churches. Now, this is sometimes a topic that people find difficult. Um, so it's important for you to recognise that Germany was a Christian country. Um, it was about one third of Germans that, that identified as being Catholic and around two thirds identified as being Protestant. And as we said before, Jewish people made up around one percent of the population. Now, Germany was a fairly religious country um, in the 1930s. Many Germans regularly attended church and um, Hitler knew the Christian church could potentially oppose him. And therefore, for, for Hitler, uh, in setting up his dictatorship, it was important for him to get control over the church. So straight away in 1933, Hitler made an agreement with the Catholic Church, which is called the Concordat. And you can see a picture of the Concordat, the Reich Concordat, being signed in July 1933. Now, in this Concordat, Concordat, by the way, is another word for an agreement. The Catholic Church promised not to interfere in politics. The Nazis promised the Catholic Church would be independent and Catholic bishops all took an oath of loyalty. Now, very quickly, of course, Hitler broke his promises with Catholic priests being intimidated and arrested. Catholic youth groups were taken over by Hitler youth groups and Jewish um, teaching in the Old Testament was banned. Now, in terms of the Nazis and the Protestant Church, um, around about 40 million Germans belonged to Protestant churches. And the Nazis tried to basically bring all the Protestant churches together in the so-called Reich Church, which was led by Bishop Ludwig Muller. The Reich Church supported the Nazis with church services beginning with Heil Hitler. And the slogan of the church was the swastika on our chest and the cross in our hearts. So this was basically an attempt to sort of Nazify the Protestant Church. Now, of course, um, many German priests were unhappy with this. So many Protestant priests refused to swear the oath of loyalty to Hitler. And by the end of 1934, 6,000 German Protestant uh, priests left the Reich Church and joined the non-Nazi Protestant Confessional Church. And the founder of this was a man called Martin Niemöller, who we'll talk about in a bit more detail in just a moment. It's also important to note that Jehovah's Witnesses um, were persecuted during this time, with one third of them being killed in concentration camps. Jehovah's Witnesses refused to do the Hitler salute or indeed serve in the army. OK, so we've already talked about how the Nazis um, could perhaps have expected opposition from the churches. The Nazi focus on the court, the Führer, made Nazism itself almost akin to a religious movement. But of course, the Nazi ideas of war, violence and prejudice were massively at odds with the Christian values of peace and compassion. But much of the opposition from the church came from individuals rather than the church as an organisation. And these are the reasons why. Firstly, there were some church leaders that did undoubtedly support the Nazis. Um, and there were some church leaders that opposed them. Most of the church leaders were sort of fairly indifferent or wanted to stay out of politics and didn't want religion and politics to mix. The Nazis, of course, supported um, the sort of traditional sort of family unit and the importance of marriage. And therefore that got them some support from the church. Most church leaders also wanted to protect the church and the Nazis, of course, made initial promises to the church. The church has also felt quite threatened by communism. So, for example, in Russia, during the Russian Revolution, um, the, the Bolsheviks, um, who were the Russian communists, they actually got rid of the church. So the church has felt that um, the Nazis perhaps gave them protection from um, the, um, the threat of communism and that communism was a bigger threat, obviously, than Nazism. OK, so I talked before about how some individuals within the church opposed the Nazis. So there's three really good examples here for you to learn. The first is Bishop von Galen. He was the Catholic Bishop of Munster and he criticised Nazi racial policies in his sermons. Uh, sermons. He, he was really, really popular and the Nazis didn't dare um, try and arrest him or put him in a concentration camp. And of course, we've already talked about how in 1941 his speeches against euthanasia led to the policy being halted. Dietrich Bonhoeffer argued that true religion was standing up to wrong. He trained priests, but the Nazis closed his college in 1940, but he stayed in Germany to oppose the Nazis, helping Jewish people escape. He was eventually arrested and sadly executed in 1945. And then there was Martin Niemöller. Now, Martin Niemöller was a World War I um, hero. He'd served as a U-boat captain on the submarines. And he initially supported the Nazis, but during the 1930s, he began to realise what the Nazis stood for. And he was the one that set up the German confessional church. He was eventually arrested in 1937 and sent to a concentration camp. OK, so how did Nazi policies affect the lives of women? Well, the Nazis had a very traditional view of the role of women. 
And the propaganda poster from the 1930s shows that the Nazis favoured this traditional Aryan family, sort of inspired by the sort of traditional German peasant family. And they wanted that family to have lots of children. So within that poster, we can see um, four children um, and we can see um, that the girl, the older girl in the picture is, is being taught about how to bring up children. We can even see the um, the younger girl has got, um, you know, baby doll in her hand as well. So this idea that the role of women was to have lots of children and the Nazis wanted to increase the birth rate and the number of marriages in Germany. So the Nazis wanted to remove women from work um, and and uh, remove them from politics and government jobs. They wanted to encourage women to stay at home, adopt a healthy lifestyle. The ideal family would be Aryan. They wanted women to follow a very natural sort of peasant look, not follow fashions, not wear makeup or smoke or wear short skirts. And the Nazis believed that men were better suited to leadership and defending the country. Um, and basically the role of women should be within the home to produce strong, racially pure, pure children and the birth rate should increase. Now, one of the phrases that's useful to, to learn is this Kinderkirche, which means children, church and cooking. And that kind of sums up some of the Nazi policies and ideals towards women. So what were the Nazi policies towards women? Well, firstly, jobs and education. So women were banned from the German parliament, the Reichstag. Women lost government jobs, such as being doctors, civil servants. Many uh, teachers were fired, um, female teachers. Employers were encouraged to employ men over women. So by the end of 1934, about 360,000 women had given up work. Now, from 1936, women could not be uh, judges, they couldn't do jury service, and then in 1937, grammar schools for girls were banned. Women were also restricted from university, um, with the number of female students in higher education dropping massively. In terms of abortion and contraception, abortion and birth control was restricted to try and increase the birth rate, but um, women with inherited diseases or weaknesses had to be sterilised. So between 34 and 45, around 350,000 German women, but also there were men, were sterilised. Um, so we talked about Kinderkirche before. Uh, so the Nazi slogan of uh, children, church and cooking was central to Nazi ideas. Now, Gertrude Schultz Klink is an important individual for you to know about. She was appointed in 1934 to oversee all policies related to women. And she headed up an organisation called the DF. W, the German Women's Enterprise. Now, this was basically an organisation to promote Nazi policies towards women. Um, it had about 6 million members and by 1939, 1.7 million women had attended DFW courses on subjects like sewing, cooking and bringing up children. In terms of lifestyle, uh, Mother's Day became an official holiday in 1933. Um, within schools, girls' education was about being a wife and mother, um, so the lessons would focus on that. Healthy lifestyles and exercise were promoted with slimming, smoking and partying discouraged. Women were also encouraged to wear simple peasant style clothes, makeup, wearing trousers, dyed hair and short skirts were all discouraged by the Nazis. Now, in terms of um, trying to increase the number of marriages, reduce divorces and increase the birth rate, the Nazis um, brought in the law for the encouragement of marriage in 1933. This gave what were called marriage loans, which were up to a thousand marks to married couples if the woman stopped working. Um, couples could be let off a quarter of their marriage loan for each child that they had. From 1936, women were given monthly payments to help raise children. The divorce laws um, in 1938 said that if someone didn't have children, that could be grounds for divorce. And the Mother's Cross was given to women for the number of children they had. So bronze for four to five children, silver for six to seven and gold for eight children. And that was awarded each year on the 12th of August, which was Hitler's mother's birthday. Now, in 1935, SS leader Heinrich Himmler announced the Fountain of Life program, the Lebensborn program, which would provide nurseries and finance to women who had children with SS men. Later, the program enabled single women to have sex with SS men to create pure children. And between 1938 and 1941, one Lebensborn home helped 540 mothers to give birth. So in terms of the success of the Nazis in achieving their aims, well, marriages did increase. The birth rate did increase, or increase although it did um, fall from 1939. Uh, women in higher education fell. The DFW had six million members. Many girls joined the League of German Na Maidens, one of the youth groups. And some Nazi ideas fitted in with conservative ideas. And you can see some of the stats there on marriages, divorces and births between 33 and 39. 
In terms of failures, well, the number of women who worked rose um, during this time because of the labour shortage meant by the end of the 1930s, women had to work. And that was certainly the case during the Second World War. Women got paid less than men. So employers actually still wanted to give women jobs. So many women just remained in their jobs. Um, we talked about World War Two and then six million women worked in agriculture during the Second World War as well. Obviously, you know, at the height of the Second World War, there were 13 million men in the army. So women had to go and do the jobs that men had done. OK, so finally, in terms of social policies, young people and um, so school in Nazi Germany, teachers who refused to teach Nazi ideas were sacked. 20 percent lost their jobs in 1933. By 1937, 97 percent of teachers were part of the Nazi Teachers League. Textbooks were rewritten to fit in with Nazi ideas. Classrooms were covered in swastika flags and photos of Adolf Hitler. And um, there were different school subjects. So more PE lessons took place to keep young people healthy. Boys were needed to prepare for war and girls to be healthy and have children. In history, the focus was on how unfair the Treaty of Versailles was, uh, with Jewish people being blamed for Germany's problems. In biology, they were taught about superior, superiority of the Aryan race. In physics, the focus was on explosives and firearms. In geography, they were taught about lands in the east that Germany should take. And then there were the two new subjects of race studies and eugenics. So basically, quite a different curriculum for boys and girls in Nazi Germany. So this is very much about indoctrination of young people in Nazi Germany during this time. Now, in terms of young people in Nazi Germany, there was the Hitler Youth. So Hitler very famously said, those who have youth on their side control the future. The Hitler Youth was set up in 1926 and um, had 55,000 members by 1933. And about, about 1939, 80% of young Germans were members of one of the Hitler Youth groups. The Hitler Youth did physical activities and they indoctrinated young people in Nazi ideals, um, preparing boys and girls for their future roles. Boys were taught to be strong, fit, fearless, ready for war. They did cross country marches, close combat exercises, increasing military drill by the end of the 1930s. You know, many people were sort of complained by the end of the 1930s, the Hitler Youth had become a bit boring and the emphasis was on military drill. Girls were prepared for their lives as mothers, the emphasis on keeping fit and developing home building skills. Um, so it's, it's important to note it was actually made compulsory to join the Hitler Youth in 1936. Um, but there was still a substantial proportion, I reckon about three million young people never joined the Hitler Youth. And of course, there were rebel youth groups like the Edelweiss Pirates and the Swing Movement, which some young people joined as well. So in terms of how successful Nazi policies were towards the young, um, in terms of successes, many uh, young people enjoyed the Hitler Youth, they enjoyed the sporting activities, the camping, the hikes, the fact that young people were seen to be important, they got to march in the streets, to wear the military uniforms and the brown shirt, there's peer pressure to join. Membership increased from 5.4 million in 1936 to around 8 million by 1939. So it's popular amongst both boys and girls who enjoyed the social side and the comradeship. Um, but in terms of failures, you know, as time went on, the Hitler Youth became less popular, activities stricter, the Hitler Youth leaders became older, more out of touch, uh, could be aggressive and cruel, punish people for not running fast enough on cross-country marches and things like that. And um, more linked with sort of preparing Germany for war, very sort of militarized by the end of the 1930s. Three million, of course, never joined the Hitler Youth. We've talked about the opposition groups like Swing Movement or Edelweiss Pirates being popular. And um, there's a 1940 law actually which banned young people from being out or attending clubs after 9 p.m. So I suppose the moral of the story, I suppose, with the, the, the sort of big thing to remember really with the Nazi policies towards the young, many people enjoyed the Hitler Youth in 1933. Um, but by 1939, it was becoming more boring and more emphasis on military drill and less people were keen on it. OK, so thanks for listening to that uh, revision video. I um, hope you enjoyed it and good luck. Thank you very much. Bye bye.